So to celebrate 25 years, to know 25 years, we probably need to go back further than 25 years to see how we got to that point 25 years ago. And our first panel is actually about that. It's entitled Behind the Scenes of the NMAI Act, uh, the early years. And we are so fortunate to have two presenters, um, panelists who can speak to this with this an incredible, incredible depth of knowledge. Um, and I'd like to welcome them to, to come out now. Uh, the first is uh, Patricia Zell. She's a partner in Zell and Cox Law, uh, specializing in laws affecting American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. For the past 29 years, currently, she also serves as the editor of the Indian Law Reporter. She retired from public service in March 2005, following 25 years of service on the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, where she served as the Democratic Staff Director and Chief Counsel for the last 19 years of her Senate, Senate service. The depth of knowledge uh, possessed by Patricia Zell on these issues is, uh, is kind of unparalleled. Um, she worked for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, the American Indian Policy Review Commission, the American Psychological Association. Um, I've been so fortunate to work with her on the Board of Trustees, where she is indeed a member of the, the NMAI Board of Trustees. And, uh, so, so great to have you with us um, today, Patricia. Uh, and then Suzanne Schoenharjo, as, as Kevin mentioned, uh, winner of the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, president of the Morning Star Institute, National Indian Rights Organization, founded in 1984. She's a writer, curator, policy advocate who has helped Native nations recover sacred places, more than one million acres of land. She's been instrumental in developing uh, key federal Indian law, uh, policy advances across a huge, huge range. Uh, she's a poet, award-winning columnist, um, winner of honorary doctorate degrees, fellowships, and things like this, all kinds of wonderful, amazing things. And of course, if you've seen the Nation to Nation exhibit, a uh, really fantastic, fantastic uh, educational kind of exhibit, um, Suzanne Harjo has been the driving force and the curator on that. Um, she is a treasure uh, in Indian country, and uh, we are so, so fortunate to have her her with us as well. Since, uh, since Rick does have the laryngitis thing happening, um, I'm actually going to step in for him and uh, kind of join uh, our two panelists and kind of moderate this session. So with this, actually, I believe you're going to speak from here, right? <laughs> Good morning. This museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, has its origins in repatriation, and it all began on February 20th, 1987, when a hearing was held in the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs on a bill sponsored by Senator John Melcher of Montana. Senator Melcher's bill provided for the repatriation of Native American human remains and associated funerary objects that had been or might be found in the future on federal lands, lands administered by the federal agencies of the U.S. government. The Smithsonian Institution was invited to present testimony at that hearing, and the Secretary of the Smithsonian informed the committee in his testimony that the Smithsonian Institution was in possession of 18,500 human remains of American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. How did this happen? That day, the Congress also learned that in the 1860s, the Surgeon General of the United States put out an order to those in the field serving the United States military to gather skulls and other human remains of Indian people that they might find on the battlefields and send them to the Army Medical Museum in Washington, D.C. for purposes of scientific study. What did the Surgeon General want to study? As Rick's statement uh, indicated, he wanted to test an emerging theory of his that there was a correlation between the size of a person's cranial capacity or skull and the intelligence of that person. Apparently, there was quite a response to the Surgeon General's order because over time, thousands of human remains were shipped to the Army Medical Museum, many of them, most of them, human remains of American Indians. Eventually, too many for the Army Medical Museum to study, and so they were later transferred to the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> 
Senator Daniel K. Inoue, Chairman of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, chaired that February 1987 hearing. It was only the second hearing that he had presided over as the new chairman of the committee. And to put it simply, he was both shocked and appalled by what he heard. So after the hearing, he called the committee staff together and made it clear that it was his intent for the committee to address this matter. He was adamant that the human remains of native people who could be identified as being associated with a family or a community or a tribe of origin should be returned to their families, communities, or tribes. And for those human remains that could not be so identified, that there should be a memorial built as a respectful and final resting place for those remains, similar to the tomb of the unknown soldier. Senator Inoue wanted that memorial to be situated on the National Mall in recognition of the fact that the native people of the United States were the first Americans and should be so honored with a place of significance on the National Mall. So we began work on that and soon we learned that there was only one site left on the National Mall and that site had been reserved for the Smithsonian Institution for a Museum of Man. In our work we learned uh, from the National Park Service much about the siting of memorials and monuments, and a general gentleman from the National Park Service suggested to the senator that if he was determined to have a memorial on the National Mall, he might want to think of his memorial concept as the foundation for not only a memorial, but a museum. Several days later, the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation, Barbara Conable, invited the senator to visit the museum in New York, and the senator in turn invited the secretary of the Smithsonian to accompany him to New York, as well as our beloved Suzanne Harjo. That visit in April of 1987 turned out to be the seed from which the National Museum of the American Indian began to emerge, because as they were soon to witness, the collection of the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation was astoundingly large and vast in its representation of all aspects of the cultures of native people from North, Central, and South America. And soon thereafter, it appeared that the then current Secretary of the Smithsonian might find a way to honor the vision of his predecessor, Secretary S. Dillon Ripley, of building a museum of man, but adapting that vision to a museum honoring the nation's first people if the collection of the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation could be saved from further deterioration by transferring it to the Smithsonian Institution. The rest of the events that finally culminated in the legislative establishment by the Congress in 1989 of the National Museum of the American Indian is a much longer story that won't be recounted today because we want to keep our focus on the theme of this symposium, repatriation. At the same time that Senator Melcher's bill was sub subsequently amended to extend its reach to federally funded institutions and became the subject of another hearing in the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, there was concern being expressed by federally funded museums and various scientific institutions that their respective great collections of Native American art and artifacts would be broken up and return to Indian country if repatriation were to become a national policy through the enactment of federal law. It was at that hearing that those who represented federally funded museums and scientific institutions called upon the committee to delay action on Senator Melcher's bill so that a national dialogue amongst the museums, scientific institutions, and representatives of Indian country could proceed. It was thought that the outcome of such a dialogue might enable the shaping of a more sensitive, more limited, and more practical process of repatriation, if indeed repatriation were to be embraced as a national policy. One of the people who was most instrumental in leading this dialogue was Suzanne Schoen Harjo, who I think is the perfect person to share that chapter of the history that provides the context for this symposium. 
I will add just two more perspectives, that of the Congress and that of the non-Native organizations and individuals representing the interests of those who did not want to see a repatriation policy enshrined into federal law. From the vantage point of the Congress, repatriation had struck a human chord with many members of the House and Senate. The very notion that Native American human remains, associated funerary objects, items of cultural patrimony, and sacred objects of Native people should be locked away from those to whom they were most precious, offended even members who had not previously de demonstrated any particular interest in Indian country. But from the vantage point of those who were opposed to repatriation, many questions were posed to the committee chairman of the House and Senate, charged with overseeing and promulgating federal Indian policy. Questions like, why should we accept that something is sacred, is a sacred part of Native culture, and therefore should be a proper subject of repatriation, just because a Native person or a Native spiritual or religious leader says it is sacred? I recall one meeting in which that question spawned a discussion of, of how one could describe for purposes of federal law and requirements authorized by such a law, like a law requiring repatriation, how could one describe something that is sacred to many, such as the Bible or the Torah or the Koran? Is it that a sufficient number of people around the world hold the belief that these religious texts are sacred? And who are the appropriate keepers of things that are sacred? And should they be kept by anthropologists and libraries and museums and scientific institutions? These are the kinds of thought-provoking discussions that occurred then and that continue to make repatriation such a fascinating policy, as well as a subject that is often met with considerable resistance. Fortunately, we have leaders like Suzanne Schoen Harjo and Walter Echohawk who helped to make those discussions in a constructive and take those discussions in a constructive and thoughtful direction as you will soon learn. Thank you. So, so uh, one of the things that we, we kind of planned here is to, uh, after we uh, make remarks, we, we've actually collected some questions uh, uh, in advance. It's, um, it's also the case that in your packet, you have cards, and on those cards, you can actually fill out questions of your own. And if we have time kind of at the end of the session, the microphone's at the back, um, and we can take a few of those questions. Um, so, just a couple of things to sort of think about, if, if, if I may. You know, one of the things that's been really interesting in thinking about, for example, the history of the Indian Reorganization Act has been the way that, um, in, according to one narrative, it was sort of essentially one guy, John Collier kind of got something going that sort of matched with certain kinds of cultural things that were floating around in broader American society, and it didn't really align with other things, um, thus producing a piece of legislation that ended up being contested almost immediately at the moment, um, and, and interesting and problematic ever since. So, so the narrative that you've just offered, in some ways, makes me wonder if Senator Noe um, fits in that role as well. If, if the driving force of this was uh, his own commitment and his own passion around this and his willingness to work with Congress and to bring stakeholders to the table and to continue to push and to push and to push, um, or um, sort of alternative sense that, no, this moral issue really did strike a, a chord with Congress and made it very easy and, and, and it cleared the pathway for this. Um, so I'm wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit more about his role uh, in kind of the mechanics of it, how hard was it? It happened very quickly, uh, in, in some ways, relative to the ways that the Congress functions now. Um, so, this is actually my own question, it's not the prefigured one, but it's, I, I think it's worth sort of thinking a bit more about the ways in which one person can actually kind of drive things in relation to broader kinds of cultural uh, uh, things, other stakeholders who are also activists on the question, um, those things and how that coalition did or didn't come together. That's quite a question, multi-faceted multi question. Well, as, as I indicated earlier, the senator was, uh, first of all, he had not been exposed to Indian country uh, very much when he assumed the chairmanship of the committee. 
in uh, 1987. And so many of these issues were new to him. And as I indicated, this was only the second hearing that he chaired, the first one being on the federal budget, proposed, president's budget request. So um, this was a whole new world for him. And he could not believe that Native Americans were singled out as a group of people to, for whom it would be societally appropriate to take their remains, not only from battlefields, but indeed uh, disinter them from, from uh, burial grounds and send their remains to Washington for study. He said that wouldn't happen to any other group in the United States. People would be up in arms. And here this has been going on for well over 100 years, and no one has done anything about it. So he was absolutely, th that shock, and being really offended um, was something that became the motivating uh, and driving force. Um, I think that he was ill-prepared uh, for the resistance that came, the, the real pushback against uh, any notion of repatriation being a federal policy, let alone a federal law that could be enforced in some manner. And uh, Senator Melcher's bill was very directive in that regard. So, and, and Senator Melcher's bill at that point was the context before the National Museum of the American Indian Act um, was, being, was being formulated. And, and the reason I described those steps about how NMAI came into being was that NMAI was on a parallel track with the law that, or the bill that ultimately became the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. But uh, as, as you've indicated, Phil, uh, by today's standards, uh, and even then, the National Museum of the American Indian Act was uh, from beginning to end, from April 1987, when Suzanne and I and the Senator and Alan Parker uh, went to New York to see this great collection that was in severe state of deterioration. Uh, from that day, from April 21st, 1987, until November 1989, it took only two years to enact this massive piece of legislation, not only in terms of, of its idea, its grand idea of building a museum on the mall and a memorial on the mall, but also in terms of the amount of money associated with, uh, with that was going to be authorized for the establishment of this museum because the senator felt that American Indian people Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians had been loyal to this country, had served in the United States uh, military, put their lives in harm's way, uh, and ought to be recognized as, uh, as, as their legacy to the, to the United States had been great, and that the United States should, should essentially foot the bill for, uh, for the establishment of this museum. Uh, through much negotiation, it, that, that total figure of 100% federal funding uh, was reduced to some extent so that there would be private funding uh, also solicited. Uh, but the, the forward movement of the National Museum of the American Indian Act and the national dialogue that had been requested then served to put these two bills or these two uh, initiatives on separate tracks. And uh, the one thing that I would say was that I, I think as he was kind of very taken aback by the resistance to the notion of repatriating human remains. To us today, that sounds absolutely, makes all the sense in the world. Back then, it was quite controversial. And so he, in, in the way that he was, he took this on and, and had I'd, scores and scores of meetings with the groups that did not want to see repatriation. And we had these long discussions uh, as I mentioned, I mean, what is sacred? That was a, that was a long discussion. And, and then who's the right, who are the right people to be able to, to be making these decisions? So on and so forth. So these, these formative questions have, have continued, I think, to be the threads in the dialogues that have ensued in, in the 25, 26 years since then.
It sounds like, I mean, one of the things that uh, in Rick's remarks, you know, uh, we can see both the ways that these two acts kind of merge together, the legal kind of sort of apparatus in them is pretty similar. Um, you know, at, at the same time, there's also kind of a prime and part of at least two of the ways that people are thinking about them. One is human remains and moral kinds of obligations. The other is the question of patrimony and living cultures and support of living cultures. Um, and it, it, it's always felt to me like in some ways that the people who have been opposed to these things have, have blurred the lines of those, right? So that um, uh, the question of what is sacred, you know, who's the best keeper of the sacred, aren't these objects uh, sort of universal property which are best taken care of in museums or the guidance of curators rather than in specific tribal context by, by actual people. Um, that, that that language, who takes care of, um, has a lot to do with patrimony and comes out of that question, which is a little bit different than feels to me than the moral question of these are human remains, um, you know, and why are they in a museum? Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if that's your sense as well, and, and how that played out in the conversations around the legislation. Um, you know, was it possible to kind of separate those things out, or did they just get so mushy? Uh, because it doesn't seem like it's in anyone's advantage trying to move this legislation forward to let those things be mushy, right? I mean, it seems to make more sense to say patrimony is one particular question, human remains are another question, um, and then around human remains there's this a pretty clear trajectory, I think. There's a moral issue, uh, there's a historical issue, there's the senator's interest in a memorial kind of thing, there is a collection sitting in New York, and all of a sudden you, you have a trajectory that leads you to the NMAI. Um, on the other side, much more confused, right? On the NAGPRA, on the NAGPRA side. Um, so, so I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about how that sort of difference ended up being negotiated, since some of the players here are exactly the same players, right? In terms of those two, you know, those two acts. Well, I would defer to Suzanne for the most part on on this issue, but the the. Uh, the National Museum of the American Indian Act for and establishing this museum was was clearly the focal point of, of that effort with the national dialogue going on and this is where I think Suzanne has a much more in-depth experience as being having been part of that national dialogue the national dialogue was beginning to shape and change uh, at least at, on the surface the orientation of the initial outrage of museums and scientific institutions, which as Kevin said, and this was said not m many more times than once, that um, there, there are going to be large moving vans pulling up to the loading docks of museums and scientific institutions and everything that is native in their collections, be they human remains or associated objects, would be uh, taken from those museums and scientific institutions because they were federally funded. That was, the, that was the nexus for the United States government being able to do this. And, and that national dialogue, which was going on at the same time, began to sensitize through very good interactions. The, the committee and the committees of Congress uh, uh, participated in this just as observers. But you began to see a, a sort of an aha moment begin to dawn on many of the, in the minds of many of the opponents of, uh, and those who are resisting repatriation by saying, yeah, would I want my grandparents disinterred? Would I want their um, remains to be taken apart and, and studied? And, and, uh, and so that, that really was something that, that in, in my mind was the, one of the one of the areas where one could feel and understand, yes, if I put myself in the place of a native person, that, I, that would be highly offensive. And then who should take care of the museum of, of these things? Museums and scientific institutions at the outset said, well, you know, we have been keeping these things in absolutely terrific curatorial conditions. And if we give them back to families, tribes, communities, they don't have, they will not have the means to do what we've been doing. And if that happens, then these things are going to deteriorate and they're going to be lost. And so uh, for the good of humans, of, of our society, for history and for going forward, it's probably more appropriate. We have the means, we have the experience, we have curators. We can take care of these things better than, than tribes 
and, uh, and, and individuals and families. And um, so that was a bone of contention, and I think Suzanne, again, could maybe reply more fully. It's a moment when sort of your patrimony becomes sort of our patrimony. Right? Yes. Could you say a very, very quick word, um, and then we'll move on to Suzanne, um, just about the, the rest of the Smithsonian in relation to the NMEI Act and in relation to NACA, just to kind of sketch of that landscape. Well, um, the National Museum of the American Indian Act applies only uh, arguably to the, the National Museum of the American Indian, which of course was not, uh, wasn't formed until the act was signed into law, and uh, the Museum of Natural History. And, and there was even, there was definitely some uh, d level of discomfort about having it apply to any other uh, Smithsonian Museum. Uh, when NAGPRA came along it, the, it, and was signed into law, the, the great debate that took place then was, well, sh why shouldn't NAGPRA, which is more extensive in its coverage and requirements, why shouldn't it be applied to the Smithsonian Institution? And the argument from the Smithsonian side was, well, we already have repatriation provisions in our act. Now, those repatriation uh, provisions are, uh, it, they aren't so much tailored to Smithsonian as they uh, re represent a point in time at which the repatriation debate was going on. And that, and that debate went much further and became much more extensive. So um, to this day, the Smithsonian is, is not uh, subject to the provisions of NAGPRA, and, uh, and, but it is subject to the National Museum of the American Indian Act repatriation provisions. With that, why don't we, uh, why don't we turn Suzanne to, to some of your thoughts on, on the subject. So Patricia has a lot of the political kind of thing uh, going on. Um, Suzanne has a lot of the activists on the ground. 